Hello world, welcome back to the PG.biz podcast with your hosts, me, Brian Baglow, and the ever-divine Peggy Ansaltz. Good afternoon, Peggy. It's good to see you again. It is also good to see you as well, Brian. We've both been on the road now. I'm not the only jet setter. Oh, I have I have travelled the length and breadth, well, the length of the UK, down to Brighton. Absolute pinnacle of, of the game's calendar uh, in the UK for develop. Um Slightly unexpectedly, I thought I was going to be doing something else, but I got the opportunity to go down and just hang out with the entire games industry. So it was wonderful. I saw a lot of people I haven't seen for a very long time and managed to pick up quite a few different um, talks and topics and themes. And of course, I absolutely kidnapped each and every single one of them to bring onto the podcast in the next few weeks. So watch this space, folks. It's going to be wonderful. How about yourself? Myself, the same thing. I've been out there looking around, preparing for Gamescom, and also dipping back into some of our very, very cool interviewees that we had during GDC, which brings me to our guest today. We have not just a guest, we have an experience, an event, because it's all tied into a beta launch right now as we speak. We have Mike Levine, founder and CEO of Mystic Moose, the indie game studio and publisher that you might remember, Brian, created by the veterans of LucasArts, Activision Electronic Arts. Great team, Great timing as well, because Mystic Moose has announced their multiplayer auto chess game. Mojo Melee will launch its first season for its web version of the game today. So, hey, that's great news. And we're excited to have you, Mike. Welcome. You must be very excited as well. Oh, yeah. Really excited to be here. Really excited to launch this game, Mojo Melee. And, yeah, really excited to talk about it with you guys. And bringing it to mobile is, is an exciting next step for us. That's great, Mike. And and listen, we know that launches can be incredibly busy periods, so thanks for taking the time to join us. But let's give our audience the inside scoop on the game. Mojo, Mojo Melee. Um, chess, but different. Please, spill the beans. <laughs> sure. So it's a multiplayer PvP auto chess strategy game. We love these games. We've been kind of tinkering with them for years, and it's really a new genre. We wanted to make a game that sort of could appeal to a mass audience. We kind of focused on high action, quick feedback, but also have deep strategy for those who want to put the time in. So it's it's a new take on the genre that we're excited to unleash to people. That sounds incredible. That's that's not a mix of genres that you, you just come across anywhere. Um, so drill down into it. Is it, you know, you say auto battler. It's like for anyone out there unfamiliar with that kind of that that take, what do we mean by auto battler? Sure. Well, the game, these games are, are, and specifically auto chess, they're usually divided up into two phases, which is kind of the preparation phase where you're deciding which, how to use your gold and which units, your champions in our game, your mojos and spellstones, these new, 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 new element that we added to these games. And a- after you place them on the board and your opponent does as well within a time period, this is where the auto part kicks in. And then you kind of sit back and get to watch how your strategy played out. Did you do the right things? And usually it plays, these games take course over a number of rounds. So it's really about how you're tweaking your strategy, adjusting to your player, using your your team. And that's a major th- sort of thing that we changed in these games also is traditionally these auto chess games, and they've only been around really since 2019, but they usually, the players were pulling from what's called a shared deck, right? So players had the sort of same team they were pulling from. What we did is added elements of deck building. So kind of like Hearthstone and other games, many, where you're building your team and your comp before you go into the game. And this really changed the strategy and just gave so much different meta that people can bring into these. And every time we release new assets, which we do monthly, it really is continually changing the meta and the comps in the game. So strangely enough, going all the way back, Mike, one of my favourites from the early 2000s was The Incredible Machine, which was broadly similar. You had all the setup, you build your whole thing, and then you hit go and sit back and see if you were clever enough to, to solve the outcome. So I'm in. I'm sold. It's I'm not asking for a free copy. I will absolutely pay, but uh, I can't wait to see it. It's free to play, so you're, you're in. It's OK. There you go. You know what you're going to do next week <laughs> or sooner? I have to ask something different because we met Mike 
during GDC. So I know you're this kind of person. I would be interested in the most outlandish change, tweak, alteration in this particular version in this beta. I don't know if I'd call it outlandish, but I think adding that deck building component to these games was a major change to how these games have typically been played. And, you know, it isn't unusual to see a new genre morph and adapt. And, you know, the games, we love the games that are out there in this genre, like TFT, but we also wanted to, we felt it needed to evolve if it was going to appeal to a wider mass audience. And I think the other outlandish, I guess, thing we did is we added this new element called Spellstones. So that's, you know, up to now, usually these games, you're really just dealing with characters. These are these elements that come in three different forms in our games, but there's going to be dozens and dozens of them. I think we already have about 10 of them in the game. Um, but they, they divide into three different types, which are really like offensive, defensive, and then sort of one that can um, sort of work as a something that affects the rest of your team. So where you place these at the beginning of the match, whether they're going to boost, give a boost to your team or possibly uh, affect what, you know, you kind of have to decide where the other team might be hiding, essentially, because they go off at the beginning of the rounds is, a, is also a big outlandish, I guess, change to these games. You said it yourself. It's all about great games. In fact, all of our guests tell us, you know, it is really about the game now. And I'm excited about that because it wasn't always that way. They stand and fall now very much on their narrative. Now, yours is about nature versus technology on a mysterious alien planet. Can you unpack that a little bit more for us? I guess I'm a big nature guy. I live in a rural area. I'm very, I try to stay in touch with nature. And honestly, I learned this way back when I worked at Lucas, working, getting to go out and work at Skywalker Ranch. I really just like that balance of like, if I'm going to be sitting in front of this giant screen all day when I take my breaks, you know, it's nice to go out into nature. And so, yeah, with Mojo, there was, you know, when we started this, the, the metaverse hype was really starting to swell and, just sort of looking around at the landscape, we just saw a lot of cyberpunk and very sort of dystopian things. And I guess I just kind of figured, hey, if population is going to spend our future in these quote unquote metaverses, never liked that word, by the way. But um, I wanted to make something at least that was tied to the real world, you know, and to remind people and kids growing up that like we're still living in the real world and there are things going on um, that we should you know, be conscious of and aware of. And so, yeah, that's really sort of takes the story of what we're living through. It's a planet. It's a story we want to tell over time. So it's sort of like a mystery. It's a planet like Earth, but it's not Earth. It's similar, has all these sort of animals that we're familiar with, but they've evolved very differently on this planet. And they're great clans that have had wars for centuries and as you can imagine, all different types from warriors to assassins to clerics. And there's magic, of course. And this very strange event happens at the beginning of the story where this mysterious object hits the planet and the clans essentially have sent out scouts to learn more. And this is where they meet these magical creatures, the mojos, which are these plant-based creatures that the planet has kind of given birth to, to help defend the planet. On top of all of this, um, uh, Mojo Melee is a, a Web3 game. So, you know, it's uh, it's something that we've come across all too rarely. And it's something that we've certainly had a lot of debate and discussion around when we've, uh, when we've mentioned it on the podcast. So how are you dealing with this? Where does Web3 come in and where is it implemented in the game? We were able to raise funding pretty early on when, you know, the sort of the Web3 hype was beginning. And, you know, we've really been on the forefront in terms of our thinking about it and how we want to utilize it. And for us, you know, as I've said, the game and the fun is the focus and the headline. And what we've realized is we believe in the power of Web3 to empower players, to empower developers, but it's a feature, right? It's a feature for those who want to take advantage of it in our game. And really, we're really being subtle with it, you know, in terms of letting people experience it at the level they want to experience it and trying to educate them and really trying to make the process as simple as possible, which is, has been a big issue up to now. And what's the response been so far? Have you had any kind of any of the criticism that's been leveled at, you know, the whole crypto NFT blockchain, um, you know, appearance in games or, or have people really kind of picked up on it? 
We haven't had much negative feedback, honestly. Um, as we bring the game out to a wider audience, I'm sure we'll get some of that. But, you know, I think we have to remember that a lot of that criticism and things we hear, in my opinion, a, a lot of it comes from the press. And it definitely is more of a sentiment in North America and Western Europe, right? It's a big world. And just as as hesitant and maybe scared of it as people are here, we know that Asia and that side of the world, as we've seen before in gaming, is leading the way. And, you know, I think the CEO of Sega, and I'm going to misquote him, but he just had some great quote the day before they announced their Web3 game, but just talking about how it, it's it's foolish to ignore kind of the these things on the fringes and and the potential that they can bring. And we feel like, you know, with Sega, Square Enix, now Ubisoft, you're, you're seeing these walls crumble, more are gonna join and you're gonna see good games, you know, come out of this. And that's that's really the most important thing. And then it's up to the players to understand, hey, I'm putting in my time and money into this. Maybe it would be beneficial if I could actually own my assets and have the ability to sell them and, you know, take take participate in this economy on a deeper level. Which is to your point, exactly what's possible here because avatars are a big part of this. Players can select their own Mojo avatar. And to your credit, it's very subtle. So I can do it or I cannot do it is what I'm hearing here. Yeah, I mean, when we think about things and we're about to introduce our skins for champions and then soon um, our 3D moddable Mojos as we call them to gamers, um, you know, it's very natural, right? To have an avatar and customize it. You think of things like Sackboy and Little Big Planet, which we were actually inspired by if you look at the mojo. So we were thinking about this from the beginning. Um, and, you know, we think about things as, you know, what, do, what does just a normal gamer want, right? And these things are kind of obvious to us. And then you look at the Web3 side of it and you have to keep in mind up to now, right? And we, we try to not call them NFTs anymore, by the way, we call them digital collectibles, but almost all of them really are static JPEGs, right? And as gamers, that just didn't make sense to us, right? We wanted to bring these things to life, have them be customizable, have them actually be 3D if you're making a 3D game. So we're really trying to take the medium forward and do what makes sense to gamers versus NFT collectors. I think your approach leading with games and then going, where can we fit this in? Where does it make sense? Where does it add value? absolutely speaks to us because so many of the people we speak to it's all about the player experience the quality of that experience and and gaining and keeping their trust so my hat's off to you because it sounds like that's that's absolutely the way to to approach this yeah and and if i can i pro I'll, i like to explain also like our approach to digital collectibles in the game is we don't sell them in the game at all you know and we're working directly with apple and google on this we, we treat it just like gamers are used to, right? Purchasing in-app purchases, unlocking things. These are all, quote, off-chain items initially. And then if a player shows commitment and plays with it long enough, essentially levels up their character to the max level, then they have the ability, if they want, to claim it as a digital collectible. So we're trying to like let people show, put some commitment in. Don't just, you know, sure, they're secondary markets. They can purchase them there, which, which is fine. but for players in the game, we didn't want to just give these things away, let's say, you have to earn it. That's such a smart idea. That goes really, really well with what it is about this. You know, when you're committed to something, when it has value to you, then you start to understand the value of it. So that was actually pretty smart as far as an education effort, because it's so subtle. I'm doing it. You're not even really there telling me this very much, Mike. You're just letting the gameplay convince me of the value of what I'm doing, what I'm building, what I'm personalizing. Yep, that's the idea. Many people, most people who play our game may not even realize there's a Web3 component to it, honestly, and that's how we wanted it. So this approach, Mike, putting the player first, building Web3, it's right in the background. It's up to the players whether or not they want to engage. It sounds like you guys have put a lot of thought into this and making sure that it is a game first approach. So do you think this is a model that or a prototype that would work for, for other game studios out there who may not even be considering Web3 as yet? Look, one thing we learned early on in this space and sort of my general advice, I think also is, you know, to follow your gut, your instinct and what makes logical sense. And I think when this space blossomed and 
was getting so much hype at the beginning, a lot of people, including us, were following playbooks that really had just been written, you know, that it didn't seem like they made sense. And it didn't take long for us to realize this is the Wild West. Everyone's making it up as they go. And that's where we sort of ended up looking inward and saying, well, what makes sense? What makes sense to a normal gamer, right? So I think that's that's how we created this plan. And yeah, I, I think, you know, we're seeing other studios in this space do this. You're seeing much, much less emphasis on the Web3 parts of it. People realizing if we're going to bring this to the masses, um, it, it has to be about the game. It's just, I keep saying that again and again, it's so silly, but it, it's just really the most important thing. And, um, you know, for us, that's also why we chose mobile and cross-platform. We felt that was crucial for mass adoption. And, you know, with what happened this week with Google and Apple before that, um, you know, Google's new guidelines, I think that's just proving we made the right decision because to us, and it's still early interpreting these new guidelines, but the general sentiment is this is a very positive thing, right? Like they're officially like Apple opening up the doors for these types of experiences. So, um, yeah, we're very, we're excited to see how it evolves over time. That's fantastic. And I, I want to stay on that point just for a second, if I may, because we, we haven't actually touched um, strongly on the fact that this is a cross-platform, cross-play title. So, you know, you guys are, are clearly going after the, the widest possible audience. So are we talking true cross-play, uh, cross you know, players on multiple platforms competing directly against each other, regardless of the device? Yeah. So first of all, where our, the first version of it is on the PC or Mac, and it's browser-based, actually. So it's a browser game, made it with Unity and WebGL. So it's very easy to get into. Had lots of people tell us it's one of the more accessible games uh, just to get right into and play. That's what we wanted. Um, and then we also have the mobile app, which is in open beta on Android and iOS coming right behind it. And yes, it is true cross play. You can play with the same account. You'll be playing people who either will be on mobile or desktop. You won't know. And yeah, that's something that was just very important to us. Um, one, I'm a big believer in cross play as a future of games and it is difficult to support as a small indie studio, to be honest, but we felt it was important. And I'm also a big believer in browser based games. And that's why we decided to lead with WebGL first. And I feel that browser based games have a bright future and we might be on the cusp of a, of a resurgence really of those types of games, which will really bring a whole new dimension to cross play be easier for developers to maintain one code base. And um, yeah, I think with WebGL and other technologies coming, it's a, it's a very exciting time. Now that's interesting because for so many developers, so many studios out there, the browser is, is a tool. They're not looking at it as a platform, but of course it's a hugely powerful platform. Um, so I, I'm really, i um, thrilled to hear that you think it could be a resurgence because as somebody who, who goes back into the early days of Flash gaming, it was always my, my first stop. Yep. And I think it's it's been neglected for a long, long time because as you say, it gives you a simple, easily maintained code base and you can reach out across multiple devices because pretty much everything, whether it's on your desk or in your pocket, has a browser of some form. And they tend to be pretty powerful. So I'm I'm delighted. Yes, some of us remember if we're old enough, it wasn't that long ago really, but new grounds and addicting games and mini clip, right? And what put an end to that their dominance, let's say, or their you know, that era I think was mobile and the app stores. But I think things can come full circle, right? And now we see app store fatigue and things like that, you know, and there's there is those games that still exist and they're played by a lot of kids and played at school on Chromebooks and these sites still exist. And it seems potential that the next era of these games can sort of 
begin to emerge. And that, that's what we tried to do. It's also very significant while we're talking about sort of emerging platforms. You know, we're talking about mini games. We're getting very excited about what's coming next. But actually, there's like an element of re-emerging platforms, Brian, if you think about it, you know, mm -hmm. is very yeah. bullish about this and that this could be the future, you know, of of the cross play of, of cross platform that we're going to go to browser as much as we are also excited about mobile. I mean, it might finally come together. That would be something we can dream. <laughs> we can dream. <laughs> I love it. I love that, it. That is that is something that I, I, I think we can we can be confident about is we're not entirely sure where we'll be in the next five years. Ten years down the line, we can probably guess more easily. Well, we're talking about cool trends. I'm excited because you're so bullish about this, Mike. And it fits, Mike, because your colleagues call you, quote, a fearless entrepreneur with outstanding drive, vision, and resourcefulness. From the start, you have defied the odds. Maybe you can share something that you would tell them they're doing right or doing wrong or missing completely. As an indie startup, I think, you know, sort of contrary to what I was saying earlier about trusting your gut, you also always have to remember you're running a business and you're employing people who are going to depend on your decisions, right? And the risks and the decisions you make um, are really critical, right, to, to everyone's future, I think. And I think also as an indie and a startup in general, one thing I've realized also is time is your most precious commodity, right? And every decision you make like you know we don't have a company of 150 people right so it's very critical where we spend our time and the things that we do and um it, it's it's really i think important to think those things through because it's very easy to get caught up chasing rabbit holes wormholes in this space that in the end you're like why am i doing this like where is this going to lead us and so timing is everything right it's like comedy and so with a lot of technology, you see these these waves happen, and the you know as people say, the trough of disillusionment. But things always come back, and they come full circle. So, Mike, we know that you've you've worked in AR. We we know that you've you've done the augmented reality, the immersive tech. So, um, what, where are you coming from with this? What have you found that works? And and you know how how are you feeling? Um, are you equally as bullish on the on the future of immersive tech and AR as you are on? browsers and cross-platform you know so my long-term view is i'm very bullish you know i i think we're seeing the beginnings of a tech revolution right with ar xr ai all these things like you have these different people in these different camps and even blockchain it's all going i think coalesce into this amazing future short term however i i'm much more guarded and we really we made a decision you know, about, I guess, three plus years ago to sort of pull back from mobile AR gaming. We had Apple's AR game of the day. I think the first one they gave that to, we worked with Phil Tippett. We worked with every major company in the space and did big projects for, for big companies that were games and stuff for the Super Bowl. And in the end, just I realized that as a form factor on the phone is very limiting, right? Like people, you can only hold up your phone for about 30 to 60 seconds. And that's why you're seeing the most successful AR things on mobile, be Snapchat and Eighth Wall, these little campaigns that are done. And just as a gaming platform, we realized it was very limiting, right? And so we developed also for the HoloLens, we lived through that. And so, you know, I, I sort of realized that it's going to take at least in my opinion, about 10 years for this to become sort of mass market. This is something that was drilled into me at a very young age when I worked at LucasArts, you know, they used to call it LCD back then, lowest common denominator. You know, how do we get this these games into most, right? You remember that term, no one says it anymore. But, and so that's that's one thing with, with the Vision Pro. And I think now we're hearing they're only gonna make, you know, 150,000 initially. It, it's really gonna take years and, and I, I, I'm so excited to see what people build on it, but um, we're going to be probably waiting for a little bit just to see how it evolves this time. You know, we started with the news. We started talking about your game. We've gone through the game. And I think it's great to go full circle and end there because you've just launched the beta. What's next, Mike? Um, well, 
we're really excited for the future, bringing this game out full launch, both platforms and mobile, keeping the web up. We have some really exciting partnerships that are coming up and ex other exciting announcements that are going to help us bring this game to the masses. And I think really just excited to see what people think about a new take on this genre, really, that can hopefully move it forward and just continued improvements we're going to be making, listening to our community. We have a very active Discord, so love people to come on and join in the conversation because we really do listen. And we've been developing this game really with our community, you know, in beta for the last nine to 12 months. And so all their feedback really is something that we have listened to quite a bit and has gone into this game. And I'm also excited about how you approach sort of the user education side of this, the player education side, um, you know, letting them discover what they want to do with the game and also letting them become more committed with the whole idea of personalizing their avatar. I mean, that's going to be exciting to watch as well because you aren't telling them. You're just sort of letting them discover it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, one example of this, I think, and, you know, look, again, I'm not saying we we have the answers. This is all new. We, I remind my team of that all the time when we're we're having vigorous discussions about it. It's like no one's right here, guys, right? Because this is all new, right? And we're trying to figure it out. So I think that's something that we all have to remember. But one thing we had a lot of talks about recently, we just did a big overall to our Discord, and we sort of preparing ourselves for you know people coming in who know nothing about the Web three side of things. We didn't want them to be intimidated or so you know discord has a new feature where you can onboard people and ask them questions so we're using that and roles and it's like if you're just a gamer and you don't want to hear about that stuff you come in make a few simple choices you, you won't see any of that stuff but we also have like a channel we call digital collectibles 101 and that's for people who are just let's say curious and want to learn more and keep the conversation just on a sort of educational level and then if you are hardcore Web3 person, you can choose that role. And we have a special place where you can talk about those kind of things and you know, not scare off just gamers who are here for the game. And that's how we're approaching it. We'll see how it works. Um, but we're, you know, and, and people can move around, nothing's gated. You know, it's really up to them when they wanna take that step, if ever. I love that approach, Mike, because again, it, it's exactly what we're finding in so many other platforms and so many other types of game where you let the player choose their level of participation. You recognize there are different types of player who are looking for different experiences or to get something out of the game. So um, our fingers are crossed. We hope that works out as well as it possibly can for you. And again, we will see if we can get you back further down the road and you can tell us from the heights of stardom exactly how well it is done. Obviously, you know, if you'll still talk to us after the you know, millions of players and billions of dollars have rolled in. Thanks for the well wishes. I'll, we'll come back either way. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that part. Excellent. It's, it was not a conditional offer, you know, so it's not as you have to have millions of players and billions of dollars before you can come back. We'd be delighted to see you regardless. So before we let you go, we have a couple of questions that we ask every one of our guests. The first one is, what game are you playing right now? What's, you know, in your pocket or on your on your laptop that you're, you're um, obsessing over? And secondly, favorite game of all time. So no pressure, but uh, we'd love to A, find something new and B, see what's your fave. Um, so my favorite game I'm playing right now um, is this little thing called ChatGPT. Oh yeah, mm. I've heard of it. <laughs> I, there, I, I consider it condition? a game. Yeah, well, okay. you know, it's something that, yeah, you, 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 you constantly are getting, I'm trying to get better at and learning how to get more out of it. So I do feel like there's a little bit of gamesmanship going on in that. Um, yeah, I mean, the other games I'm playing, I'm usually playing games, honestly, to educate myself at this point, because, you know, it, it should be more for fun, but I'm always, it, it is fun, of course, but I'm like, oh, this is how they do that. You can't help it. I make games. So I've been playing, like, we play a lot of Brawl Stars. You'll see a lot of Brawl Stars. I, I play it and, um, also, AFK Arena, um, Hero Wars, games like that. I've been checking out a lot. My favorite game of all time, I guess I'm going to just be heavily biased and go old school from my past, but uh, probably I'm going to say Day of the Tentacle. Um, I feel like that was such a seminal 
moment in games. Um, you know, it was really the beginning of CD-ROMs. It was the first time we'd seen that level of animation in games, characters, voiceover. The time travel puzzles are just genius and mind bending. And I just feel like, you know, that was a, I have just incredible memories of that. I actually didn't really work on it. I tested it some at Lucas, but it's something I'm always going back to, I guess, going back to the mansion. And uh, hopefully there'll be a sequel. I'm crossing my fingers with the success of Monkey, the new Monkey. That would be phenomenal. That would be phenomenal. It's the, the whole point and click and the whole choose your own adventure one of my favourites of all time. So I am very much with you. And yes, it's if uh, if you're listening out there, a sequel would be very warmly received. For sure. Long overdue. Well, there we go, folks. What an incredible chat. What a great conversation. What a lot of stuff to unpack. Mike, we can't thank you enough. It has been an absolute joy. We appreciate you coming on, especially at such a busy time for you. Um, so, you know, please don't be a stranger. Come back again. I would love to have you back. And thank you so much for telling us more about Mojo Melee. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for giving us the time to talk about the game. Really great conversation in general. So, yeah, love to come back anytime. Well, I will be booking you, Mike, that's for sure. And thank you also for sharing your lessons. I think that's really important with our audience as well. And the role of choice in all of this. It's going to be exciting to see how your game evolves. And yes, we will have you back. So thank you. This show is all about how to do your job better, how to make an amazing game, how to market it. And you have a say. So if you have a story or know someone we need to shine a light on, then we would love to hear from you. We want to hear from you. We want to reflect the reality of the mobile games market in all its wonderful complexity and strangeness. So if you have any suggestions for us, if you have any feedback for us, you can always get in touch. You can email us at podcast at pocketgamer.biz. You can find us on Twitter at pgbiz. And you can reach out to us through the pocketgamer.biz website. If you're interested in listening to all of our podcasts, you can find them at pocketgamer.biz forward slash podcast. And we would love to hear your thoughts on future shows. And we've got you covered on all the major platforms. So subscribe to the audio podcast, as Brian said. Look for us on YouTube. If you want to read it, hey, you can do that too, because we have a companion post for you as well on the pocketgamer.biz website. Tune in again for the next edition of the pocketgamer.biz podcast and we look forward to speaking to you in the near future. Until then, I'm Brian Baglow. I'm Peggy Ann Saltz and that's a wrap until next week. Yeah.